Good morning and welcome to today's briefing room where we get a chance to speak with the leaders of our country about their portfolios and the media gets an opportunity to ask pertinent questions about any issues which are currently associated with the portfolios or in the news. Today's guest is Minister for Local Government and Culture, Senator the Honorable Fortuna Belrose. Welcome Minister. And thank you so much for being here with us today. On short notice, I might add, thank you very much for being with us. Um, thank you also to the members of the media in attendance today. And of course, to the St. Lucian public um, viewing us right now live on NTN. Thank you for joining us as well. We would like to get right into it like we normally do on Briefing Room. We start with having the minister or the representative to go through their portfolios, their responsibilities, so that we can better understand understand um, what work you do mm. on a daily basis. You handle the portfolios of local government and culture. Mm -hmm. Can you just um, give us an overview of what those portfolios entail? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Nicole, for having me. And of course, thank you to you, the members of the media, and of course, the viewing public, um, for this opportunity to share in terms of the work program um, of the Ministry of Culture and Local Government. Um, the Ministry of Local Government and Culture, of course, um, was strategically designed um, to ensure that from a, from a local government standpoint, our people were empowered to be able to determine their own destiny. Um, I think the, the, the thinking of the new government is to ensure that the local government councils across the country are deeply involved in the management um, of all the public assets um, of the organizations and everything that belongs to the jurisdiction, you know, fall underneath the town and village, the town or village council that it represents. So the responsibility is a vast one, um, and it's vast in, 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 because there are a number of um, var var variables at play um, in terms of dealing with the local government councils across the across the country. Um, we've been able to establish all the councils. Um, we've been able to establish chairpersons as well as the, the mayors of the various towns mm -hmm. um, and chairpersons of the, of the, counts, of the, of the, the area districts. Um, and of course, we've been able to put in a team of persons across the country who have been involved in some way or the other in the management um, or the development of organizations within the communities. So we are quite satisfied with the teams that we have working with the councils to be able to realize the goal that we want of ensuring that communities take greater ownership and are more actively involved in their own development um, on the ground. Um, from, the local, from the culture standpoint, um, we have been doing quite a bit of work um, with, within the cultural realm. Um, as it is now, what we, because culture is who we are, you know, um, and it's the, it's the beginning and end of everything that mm -hmm. we do, really, um, as a people, um, it means that we have to ensure that we create the environment for the, 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 the right type of solution, you understand, to emerge um, for the 21st, 22nd and 23rd century. We need to be able to do some fundamental things to get our citizens to understand that we are one people um, and we have to work collectively together to realize anything that we want. But we want an environment where people are comfortable, where they are free to express themselves, um, where they can be a part of those organizations within those communities without feeling that um, there is any bias um, on, on anyone's part. So we really want to create a, an environment that facilitates and encourages citizenship involvement in community and, of course, nationally. Thank you, Minister, very much. Um, mm -hmm. I want to start by concentrating on the local government aspect mm -hmm. of your portfolio. Tell us a little bit about the government's intentions um, with local government and how it actually works. Mm -hmm. Well, with respect to local government, the government, the government is very clear. What we want is an empowered solution, Lucia, where citizens determine what it is that they want. Um, as it is now, there is some degree of that. Citizens are already determining what they want. They, they know where they want to go. Um, but I think to a large extent over time, there's been some laissez-faire attitudes which has crept in. Um, and, I, and I say this because if you recall when we, the new mayor came in, mm -hmm. the, let's look at the city of Castries, Castries. for example. Um, the mayor came in, Castries was swamped in a mess with old tents, with all, all, you know, all kinds of things mm -hmm. you could think of, which didn't make the city what it ought to be. The environment was just not right. You know, things were hanging loose in that city. 
Um, and of course, understanding the vision of and being passionate about the city, I think he and his team moved in to solve some basic problems for us. Um, and I think of the situation around the, around the Ave Maria school, a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. Youngsters going to school every day, but have to traverse underneath old tents and meet all kinds of characters, vending business around, around the school premises. So a deliberate action was taken to clean that up. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it was not a popular decision, but people are now realizing the mess it was. You understand now that it's out. So it's doing those little things in communities to, to regain the confidence of the people and the confidence of the citizenry that, yeah, we can really make a difference. And each and every one of us, if we contribute to that process, the society would be a much better place. So what are they actually, before I throw it to the media, mm -hmm. what are they actually in charge of when it comes to local government in the communities? Oh, I see what you, yeah, where you're going. Um, as it is now, the, the, and, and maybe we should look historically at local government as well, um, because prior to 1979, the local government councils had more autonomy. Um, and of course, there also was a devolution of some power because the government, they ran elections um, and of course people were elected to serve in those positions. And these people had the authority now to literally manage all the public facilities within their jurisdiction. There was greater control by them. Um, by 1979, there was a change. The administration, of course, decided to abolish the whole local government regime. Eh, people mm. were too, I guess, you know, <laughs> you know to have people. But again, it's a small society with limited resources. And so when you're trying to devolve power to people, um, one has to really be realistic in the scheme of things. Um, and so the councils are primarily responsible, particularly in the city, in, well, I see the city areas within their jurisdictions. They're primarily responsible for the administration of some government services um, on the ground in community. And of course, providing feedback really to main quarters you know, on developments within the area and what needs to happen. They also serve as agents on the ground for government or for other agencies trying to implement projects within those communities. Okay. But to a large extent, they are restricted in terms of their own ability to do things on the ground. Okay. Do we have any questions from the media regarding the aspect of local government? Jeanette? My question is, the, um, I believe it was the previous UWP administration had indicated to return the voting where there was elections and so forth mm -hmm. for the local government, the, the councils. Mm -hmm. um, is the UWP, current UWP administration looking to go that route? And if so, how far along is that process? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very good question. Um, the government of St. Lucia is committed to the process of elections. Um, for local government. Um, we're currently undertaking a couple of studies and all of that, of course, is phased. Um, the first phase of the study is to provide the, the, the greater empowerment um, or greater power to them to be able to work through and be responsible for the various facilities and other public assets on the ground. Moving up from that stage, it's about continuing to build their capacity to be able to realize the elections later down the road. It will happen within this, within this regime of government. Um, the elections of officers will happen within this regime of government. But I think what we need to do is to ensure that we, we, we graduate to that level as opposed to just doing elections at random so that persons can just take on ownership. We need to build capacity and ensure that when the leaders take on that responsibility, they know exactly what it is that they're doing and how to offer leadership to the communities so that they are better. We need a clear understanding of that process, and, and that's happening at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of systems are in place to ensure the accountability of these councils? Well, it varies in, in, in some areas, but across the board as it is now, the councils are governed by the Finance Act, which is what the government of St. Lucia utilize, use, uses, so that the various councils all report to central government on all the resources that comes into the coffers. Um, in the case of the Kashmir City Council, it is a bit different, but they still have that responsibility to submit all the information to the government by the end of the year, do an annual report to the government at the end of the year. Um, in terms of the, the accounting to the public, every town and village council um, has a responsibility to engage the public and to do the public meetings 
um, and of course respond to the requests of the citizens within their communities um, for engagement at any point in time. So the citizenry of the various communities can actually make a request and make a demand for you know, the meetings and accountability of those councils on any matter. That is there for them. Um, and what, what would some of your suggestions be to engender a renewed community spirit um, through local government as a means of mitigating, mitigating sorry, crime in St. Lucia? Right. Um, I think the, 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 the beautiful thing about local government is about people taking ownership of the various communities or the various um, assets and everything else within their communities. But being engaged and being involved in your community to the extent that you know what's going on. Um, in years gone by, we, we, we had the, the, the communities where you had the watch, the watch groups, mm -hmm. you had development committees, you had mothers and fathers groups. People were looking after each other. They were looking out for each other. And in those days, of course, the, the local government regime was stronger. You know, people, people accounted, the development communities were vibrant, um, the mothers and fathers groups were vibrant. Um, today, there seemed to have been a breakdown. Today, there is a breakdown you know, of the systems with respect to community organizations. Um, while you do have a number of groups that function, you still don't have, to my mind, sufficient activity on the ground in small communities in terms of keeping people engaged on, on, you know, on, the, on, on the issues. And so we need to look out a lot more for our neighbors. We need to look out a lot more um, for the people and what comes into our community. Some of us are very active on the ground in our communities, so we know what's going on at all times. But people generally need to be more vigilant. And that is what local government uh, you know, uh, affords, really to be conscious of what's going on in your environment, participating in your environment, and being involved in making decisions and finding solutions to issues. And so if people are that inclined, then we could see you know, um, the crime issue being diminished significantly because people would be, would be trusting each other a lot more. Um, and of course, you would know how to respond to the issues that come, that, you know, that come, come, come to play. Um, we have a number of persons who facilitate crime um, in some of the communities, and people know who they are. But again, because of the way the system flows of justice within the country, um, it's not as swift and smooth as we would like. Um, you do have people being, um, uh, not being receptive to providing information um, as quickly as possible to, to the powers that be. I don't know if I answered the question, but I think <laughs> we, we really need our people to be involved in the process. Um, but people need to feel safe and secure in so doing. And um, community organization, community togetherness um, can assist in making that happen. Do we have any other questions on this issue? Um, I wanted to ask, as um, Tony brought up the question, and Janelle as well, in terms of training for persons who join the local government mm -hmm. um, movement, is that ongoing? Because, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you would want a lot of young people to understand the process, how they can join mm -hmm. in the process. How do you get that going? Mm -hmm. Well, well, they, uh, m many of the communities do have the social transformation officers, youth development officers, who are responsible for providing the opportunities for training and strengthening the capacity of our young people in various areas. Leadership training, finance, management, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, the opportunities are there. And you do have a number of organizations still that exist that provide that on a continuous basis. Um, in, in the case of our ministry, um, we do have now, we have a number of after school programs that are currently ongoing, um, equipping youngsters with the skill sets to be able to take on the leadership um, of organizations, you know, as well. So that's an ongoing program within the ministry. Um, perhaps we need to be more vocal and, and, of course, air what is happening a lot more. But there is a lot of that going on at the moment um, as we speak. Yeah, I also think since mm -hmm. we're on this topic, we should also take the opportunity to commend the mayor um, of Castri, as you mentioned, yes. who's been doing um, phenomenal yes. work. Yes. And I'm sure there are other people who are yes. part of the local government mm -hmm. um, movement who are doing work in their mm -hmm. communities, and we maybe don't hear about them mm -hmm. enough. So it's definitely yes. a good thing for our community. Yes. Um, we should move on to the mm -hmm. um, section of culture. Mm -hmm. Me and you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about what culture is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. what it represents. Mm -hmm. Before we throw it to questions, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, how do you manage mm -hmm culture because that's basically the task yeah. um, that you have is it something that can be managed mm -hmm. well yes it can be managed i think um 
basically what we want as a country is to ensure that St. Lucia emerges as a major culture player in the region. Um, and we do have that ability to be able to do it. Um, culture is at the beginning and end of everything that we do. So as a citizenry, what we sell, who we are, you understand, is really the culture, you know? So it's, it, yeah, it's big. Can it be managed? Yes, it can be managed. Um, and there are those moments in our history, I reflect, which have really been defining for our culture um, as a people. And I think over time, this country has been, um, I don't want to say, I don't want to say, we, we've moved from where we were as a friendly, loving, engaging, warm person who looked out for their neighbor consistently. We've moved from that, you understand, um, in the last 17 years, 17, 18 years. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, as a, a, a person who worked in the field of youth development, sports, and, and even culture, um, I saw the degradation when it was coming. And it's sad to say that. But I think when, when you have a government who, or a, a political party, because the parties influence what happens with respect to our culture. And so when you have a government or a political party that pushes an agenda of only providing for its membership, you understand, um, and, and looks out and, and tries to ensure that that is entrenched within a system of affirmative action, it means that the society is disenfranchised because only a select few would be able to get that attention. And as I go around the community, um, in my new state as a politician, it is so sad that this is very evident. So you walk in a community, you see a drain started here, and mm -hmm. it ends right in front of another person's house because the person does not support the party. You understand? And this is not good because for relations between the, the two neighbors, we need them to agree, you understand, to mm -hmm. mutually agree with what is happening around us. So if the drain is flowing into my yard, you know, by a problem created by the, you know, the other so party, are, are you saying it that, is a challenge. Are you saying that politics has infiltrated our culture in a very negative way? It has destroyed our culture. And, and you know, and, and this is the thing, and solutions need to recognize that. Um, we lived harmoniously as a people before. And what this government is trying to do now is to begin to rebuild and use our culture to heal the wounds in our country. Too many people are divided for political reasons. Too many neighbors do not talk to each other for politics. You know, too many of the projects that we do in the community are political. So people cannot connect to them or they impact them negatively when they should not. And so the onus is on us now as a new government to ensure that we pull our people together so they understand that we all matter. We all are part of this beautiful country called St. Lucia. And so we will use the culture in whatever way we can for economic gain for our people, but more importantly, to continue to build um, peace and social cohesion within our society. Okay, and, and that's what we have to do to okay. move our country. Well said. I will now turn it over to the floor. Okay, um, Madam Minister, in a previous conversation I had with mm. you, we spoke um, a bit about Kyle Festa when the team returned from mm. Kyle Festa. And you had suggested at the time that um, possibly through your ministry that there will be some sort of national symposium, if I may call it that, whereby we begin to look at how we fund such processes. It's not a matter of individuals coming and expecting certain things, but there's an actual process. Because prior to KFS, you know, there's some sort of controversy about the government not supporting the team and what have you. As well as just recently, we had um, the participation of a St. Lucian at the mm -hmm. Miss Universe pageant. Um, what say you to, to the fact that um, the time has probably come where we really need to sit down and look at all of these activities, these cultural activities, the arts and entertainment, what have you, um, to the extent that we could begin to prioritize what government actually supports? Yeah. Well, government supports its people and culture, I must say that. Um, but there are some peculiarities of certain events. Um, and one of the things I want to emphasize here is that St. Lucia, the, number, the people who support the arts in St. Lucia, to a large extent, do not have the disposable income, you understand, to support in the way that they would like to. Um, and because a, a number of our people are poor, you know, and so they're not able to go out and give that support. However, if we use the, 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 the cultural assets that we have in terms of our kudme, our susu, you understand, if we, if we look at our history and the way we've been able to achieve and make progress in, in, in times gone by, 
we have some wonderful attributes that can assist us in making it more sustainable than it currently is. Um, for the Carifesta, for example, I, and I still believe our, the government's position was the right one, if we're looking to send a team overseas to represent us, that team must contribute to the process. You have to participate. St. Lucians have to know who they are. You understand? And there's nothing wrong in that team putting on that production across the country, generating revenue, raising funds for that process. That is how a small, poor country survives. It cannot survive by just, you know, government just giving it everything. We have to contribute to the process. And that's the only way we can take ownership. When we are part of that process, we take ownership for it. We must be prepared to make that commitment. The footballers do it. The netballers do it. The table tennis players do it. That is how our country moves. We have to be a part of that process. And anyone who is saying to us, we cannot do it. We, have, we cannot do the kudme. We cannot participate. We cannot run the susu. We cannot organize ourselves in that way. And we should not do it. I think that person is against the culture of this country. We are people who believe in networking and working together to realize the goals that we have. And we have to use the systems, we have to use our culture, we have to use our history to be able to get us there. And that's, that's the way we see it from the government of St. Lucia's perspective. <coughs> Madam Minister, good morning. Good morning. Um, you just returned from a conference on cultural preservation and sustainable mm -hmm. development. Um, what are the real plans for the cultural center and the Walcott House? Mm -hmm. The, the, the Walcott House, I think the, the, the plans remain. I think we're just working now to realize the resources to be able to do the tours and continue the work um, that has be, that, that the National, National Trust um, begun um, a while back. So that is very much on the cards. Um, in terms of, what's the other, the other part of your question? I lost it. The cultural center. The cultural center. And you know, I want to say something again too. The cultural center, from all indications, is limited in terms of what it can offer us as a citizenry. If we are looking to ensure that culture and the creative industries become a greater part or contribute a greater amount to the GDP of this country, we need to find a space that can work for us. We need to find an avenue where young people will be excited to come and participate in the events that we're doing. We need to find a space to give young people that opportunity to be able to explode. Yeah. Currently, we are restricted with what we have. We need to find that space. And that is the essence of the government's position. We want to find a space that young people can come to and be excited. The older folks can come to and be excited as well. But we need to find a space to give them that opportunity to breathe and ventilate. And we're clearly restricted in terms of what we offer at the, at the National Cultural Center. And that's the position of the government of St. Lucia. But that's something we've been hearing for years. Yes. And, you know, um, to date, we're yet to see any um, serious action take, be taken, as well as when can we see the recommissioning of the Walcott House, since you said there are plans mm -hmm. to, to get it up. And I think, yeah, I think with respect to the Walcott House, perhaps in the middle of next year, you should see the, 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 the plan coming through in terms of the tours, etc. That's, that's, that's happening. Um, with respect to the building itself for the cultural center, of course, it's a matter of resources. We have to wait till we get it. Um, that's why I've not been speaking too much about it, because we need to find the money to make it happen, to realize the dream. In the meantime, what the government is doing is we've been working with some Jamaican companies to try to assist us to provide a space for the young artists, the young musicians who are so creative about their music, who are so you know, good about the music. We want to be able to provide the opportunity for them to develop their own music locally. And that's where we are in terms of trying to work on building some studios for these young men um, and women to be able to excel in the music that they're creating. Okay. Um, Wasco has cut the water supply um, at the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds. That's culture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from, from, what, from my understanding, um, Lucilec is as well on the verge of disconnecting power at the facility, owing within the range of about three hundred thousand mm. dollars thereabout, um, as well as the the bill from CPL has not been paid. Um, I think the government coming into office um, July August last year borrowed money to pay. 
um, bills at the facility. Um, can you explain why this So you're current... asking me that in my capacity as Minister of Culture. Not, I'm not Minister of Sports, huh? <laughs> <laughs> why, why As Minister are of Culture. But I think, let me, let me tell you, the, the, the situation with the, the sports and recreational facilities um, is that these facilities, when they're built, are built more from a social standpoint for the country. You recognize that people must have areas for recreation, for play, to ventilate, for health and well-being, um, and so and also to the opportunity for mass exposure for your country, mm -hmm. because we do it for we use it for the international cricket, for major events, etc. So you build those facilities not really in the hope that you would get any major financial benefits from them, but you build them because there's a social cost. You understand that the country knows that it has to absorb with respect to the development of these, um, of, these, of these facilities. Having said that though, I think it's important that any government you know, look to how we can make these facilities a lot more um, economically viable. So I mean, perhaps the use of energy saving mechanisms, um, you know, and just finding a team of persons who'd be prepared to be able to give you the service um, at less cost. Yeah, and, and put in the facilities at less cost. Why is it putting the facilities? But your utilities and everything, meeting them at less cost. Um, but the point needs to be made that these facilities, when they are built, are not built to generate revenue. They are built because the country recognizes that there is a, 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 an important aspect of human life that needs to be catered for through culture, the arts, programming, whatever programming, you need to be able to provide an area for your people to recreate, ventilate. Um, and so there is a cost to be born with that. The challenge is for those managing it to be able to manage it and program for the payment of those bills, those utility bills that will come. To a large extent, that is where the crux of the problem is because every five years or so, they find themselves in that situation where it is ignored. That's not the first time it's happening. It has happened before. We need to program and plan to pay our bills on time. You know, and that's something not only for the facilities, but across the board, solutions incur expenses and you're not able to pay them. We need to plan our business properly. That's a cultural phenomenon that we have to be dealing with there now. Yeah. I realize we kind of moved a little bit away from culture, mm -hmm. but I'm, I kind of like the way um, Sheffield was going mm -hmm. with some of the questions and your answer mm -hmm. too revealed a lot. As a country, I've found that sometimes we do enter into situations where we do build huge structures mm -hmm. um, for certain reasons, mm -hmm. of course, like you said, some of them are very important. Mm -hmm. Look at the situation the government is currently facing mm -hmm. with regard to um, the Owen King Hospital mm -hmm. in terms of finding the funds mm -hmm. to actually operate mm -hmm. um, that structure. Do you think, and I know this is not really your hat, mm -hmm. but do you think we do have an issue with not assessing properly before we build things, how we will make it sustainable, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and how mm -hmm. we will, because obviously the Darren Sammy Cricket Stadium hit some major mm -hmm. stumbling blocks in terms mm -hmm. of getting the mm -hmm. bills paid. Mm -hmm. And we have more mm -hmm. things to come yeah. um, that are kind of in the same boat. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that point is well made, um, um, Nicole. And I think that's why, I, from what I know of the government's program, particularly with respect to the sporting facilities, there is a current review, up, review. review happening yes. with a view to reducing on the number. And those that are going to be maintained would be maintained with the, within the most ef efficient, um, efficient means possible. Um, but yes, you're right with respect to the absence of data in our planning um, and of course just doing things. Look at the situation in the schools. Mm -hmm. Currently we have what? We, we, we have quite a number of primary schools um, and secondary schools in St. Lucia, but the population of students is now mm -hmm. dwindling. Yeah. And so we're still caught with all these huge structures that we have to maintain, maintain. Um, and we have to ensure that they become useful, you understand, to us in the various communities. So it's a major challenge for the government. The government is aware of it. Um, and of course, now in the case of sports, there's a review. In the case of education, there's also a review going on to see what we can amalgamate, um, what we can transform. You understand, um, and of course, what we can even do without. And these you are know, some of these areas. are some of the sometimes difficult decisions that yes. government has to make that is not really received. Um, well by the public, mm -hmm. but these are decisions that yes. have to be made in yeah. order for us to sustain um, those facilities. Absolutely. Chanel? Yes. Yes. Um, wanted to know how is the government um, facilitating artists in accessing opportunities under the EPA for export of their talents and cultural exports and so forth? 
Well, one of the critical things I always like to mention with the artists is that the, from an individual artist standpoint, um, we do have opportunities for them to engage with our staff um, who can assist in directing them in the right way. Um, the other major thing for the artists too is that they need to be more organized. And I think because, again, the culture, they've been left for so long on their own without, um, I don't want to say direction, but without being channeled into the right, the, the right way of doing things. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit chaotic for the artists at the moment. Um, I recently came back from the ACP Ministers' Conference, and it is very clear that organization is key. If we want to access resources, if we want to create any dent and, access, uh, and, and receive anything of, of, of significance, we need to be organized. And so we're asking all our artists, the musicians, the dancers, the, 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 the how do you call it, the literary giants, we need them to come together so that there can be an organization that represents them. Not when the cultural center is being moved for you to have a, a few people claiming to be, you understand, the representatives. But we want a sustainable organization that can work with us over time, through time. One that is not political, one that is born out of the people, for the people, to be able to represent them in the various sectors. It's very important that we do that. If we don't, then we will continue to be languishing um, the, the way we are. We need to be able to make the difference. We need, to make the, we need to be able to make the transition from me to us and our industry as a people. That's where we need to go. It cannot be individualistic. It has to be a team effort for us to be able to tap what is out there. So currently, as it stands, does the government utilize the economic partnership agreement for that purpose in... Um, giving artists the opportunity to export their, yeah. their cultures well, well, and so forth? Yes, we've been doing that. And in fact, quite a number of the artists who have come through for assistance to the ministry, we provide that support for them. Um, we also provide support in terms of, like I said, grant, assisting them in developing their own proposals, um, facilitating them overseas. So there, there is a program of support um, for, for, the, for, the, for the musicians and all these artists who come into the ministry. We do have a program for support. But what we would want to see is something that is sustained over time with an institution that works and supports the artists and provides that enabling environment for them to continue to flourish at what they do. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing. Um, what sort of uh, tangible support did the government provide to Ms. Louise Victor, who recently represented St. Lucia at the Miss Universe competition? Well, I'm fully aware that she got a financial contribution um, from the government of St. Lucia. Um, one of the things with some of these agencies, the, the Miss Universe is a franchise owned by somebody here locally. It's not owned by the government. The government is not a partner in the, in the, in the Miss Universe franchise. That is owned by a private person. So the government of St. Lucia was not in a position to dictate, you understand, to that institution um, that owns the franchise, but the government was in a position to make a contribution. And we would expect, um, having made the contribution, that the individual who is responsible for the franchise would come back home and, of course, give us a transparent account of what transpired over there and an account of the funding that, we, that the, they received as well. So, so we expect that. But it's not, it's not owned by the government of St. Lucia. This is the nature of these major, um, major events. Sheffield? Going back to my question of the Darren Sami cricket grounds, mm -hmm. if monies were borrowed last year to pay outstanding bills, why are we currently in a situation oh, where, you know, there are still errors on both the electricity and um, water utility? Well, you're giving me information. I have no idea how the bills were paid last year. Um, but all I could say to you is that it's the responsibility of Sports in Lucia, really, um, to ensure that the bills are paid. Um, but I really wouldn't know the details of how those bills were paid last year. I, I would, that's not my domain. I'm in the Culture and Local Government Ministry. That's a matter for the Ministry of Sports to, to clarify um, to you. Yeah? But as a sports person, I would jump at the, at, the, at the fact that the facilities, yes, we need to manage them more effectively. Um, but more importantly, there is a social cost to be borne when you establish those facilities. Yeah. Claudia? Good morning, Minister. Mm. Um, you've given us some insight on the plans 
of your ministry for the cultural and creative industries. Um, as the year comes to a close, can you give us an overview of what your ministry has accomplished so far and what you're most proud of? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there, there, there are several things. Um, the year has come to a close. We had, of course, a successful completion of the, the, the Soleil event. Um, if you recall, last year we began um, with Soleil. Um, it didn't go down too well with people because we changed the name, and that's another thing with our culture. We're not flexible. We're very rigid. We like to see things one way, and if it's one way, then, you know, if, if it's that way, then a lot of us would, would support it. But we live in a very dynamic environment, and um, we have to be able to respond to the needs of our society, um, as well as respond to the demands out there as well. And so the government of St. Lucia felt it was necessary to create the events company to be able to assist us in realizing even better returns on our events that we do locally. Um, so, so we were able to achieve that, and I think now that they've gone through the year, um, they'll be adequately prepared for next year because they would have had the experience of doing last year's events. So I'm very confident that in the next year, we will witness um, better, better, better programmed events um, and of course greater levels of participation because now people know for certain that it's happening. It's going to be an all-exclusive jazz festival. It's going to be exclusive roots and soul. So we know exactly what we're talking about um, over, the, over, the, over the next year. Um, with respect to the creative industries, what we've just done as a government is we have approved the framework for the creative industries. Um, if you recall the, the other service sectors, ICT as well, we've approved the framework for the operations of those industries. And of course, what we'll be doing now is finalizing the incentives for them because a number of the artists, a number of the persons in the business have been indicating to us that there are no incentives um, for the sector. But we first had to approve that framework, that broad policy framework for the, for the creative industries. We've done that now. And of, as part of the entire service sector in St. Lucia, we'll be working now with the government to ensure that we have the incentive regime organized. So hopefully that can be there by March, April next year. And so we're looking towards great things for the artists in terms of more support. Um, but again, it's all structured support. It's not just support that will come just like that, but it's support that is within a framework. Um, and of course, people have to lift their standards to, to begin to realize you know, what, it, what is in there for them. Um, another critical thing that we've done is at the end of the month of December, we are awaiting the, the review of the Cultural Development Foundation because I've always said that the CDF should be an institution that young people should gravitate to. Young people should see that institution as an institution of hope, you know, and the dreams coming true because of this institution called the Cultural Development Foundation. So we are waiting for a review, a strategic review of this organization to assist us in ensuring that we make it more accessible to all St. Lucians across the country. And any young person with talent being able to see that this institution is there for them to be able to help them, propel them to realize what they would want to within, within, the, um, within the institution. Also, mm -hmm. you were recently featured in new literature um, called Reading in Heels. Mm -hmm. um, both politics and literature are important to our culture. I would like to know how you feel about being featured and how do you think the book will accomplish its purpose of encouraging young women to participate in politics? Well, I was actually blown away when we went, <laughs> when I attended the, the, the Running in the Hills. Um, and blown away because of the, the, the statistics and the way Solita Odlam, who is one of the authors of Barbara Jacobs, were able to share and present the information on women in politics. Um, and about 42 women over the last, since 1951 or, or thereabout, have been involved in politics in St. Lucia. And I'm honored to be one of those women. Um, I must say I got into the politics really by, by chance. The community came and asked, um, and I got involved. Um, but it's something I'm enjoying because it gives you the opportunity really to transform the lives of people and to get them to see a different perspective. And it was not until I really got into the politics I realized the impact of the negative policies that the, 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 the regimes, regimes of government, you understand, have imposed on people. Um, and so, and I say that in particular with re respect to what you see in communities, the, the, the division, you know, the division even in terms of the way the footpath is done, you understand, it's not for the whole community, it's for some of the community, you know, so 
having visited the communities and picking up those si simple issues that create trauma in the lives of some people, I think I'm in it to stay. So I'm quite happy to be here, and um, I look forward to continue working with the people of St. Lucia to ensure that we can make a difference and get people to understand that the culture is all of us, and it's what we do, how we do it, um, and it's really nothing can happen if there is no culture. Culture is our future, and it's here to stay, and I'm here to be a part of that process with my people. Since we're talking about women, um, I felt like I should also ask this question. How do you think women being in politics differentiates really from men being in politics? I think women bring, uh, maybe it's because of our maternal instinct, or, or, or you know, the women bring that dimension where we are more concerned about the human component, the human element. Um, I think a man would be more on the physical side of things. Yeah, okay, the chair needs to change, then it will move. You understand? But the woman would look at the processes in moving that chair. You understand? She'd probably need to get, you know, the, the, the best fit, the right fit, the right color. There's so many things that go through a woman's head in doing one simple task, whereas the man is more, you know, um, how do I say it now, more rigid in terms of trying to make it happen. But yeah, we take time, um, we listen, and we hear beyond just what is being said. I think that is really the difference between the women and the man. We bring that human side, mm -hmm. you know, and they, a, a greater level of feeling um, and understanding of the issues and plight of our people to the dimension. And I'm telling you, I've, I've seen that every day. You know, people say, yeah, you actually came on time. <laughs> you know, you actually, you know, happy, it's amazing the simple <laughs> things, the simple things that make a difference. Yes. You know, you take their call when they call you. You know, you listen to them, you hear their stories, you hear their cry. You may not be able to help them in terms of making the, the big difference, but just the understanding of the emotion that they're going through, mm. you know, sometimes makes a difference. Mm. And I think that's what women bring. I'm not sure if Claudia was asking for herself, but she also asked you about young women mm. entering oh, yes. politics oh, yes. Oh, yes. and how um, yeah. that would inspire them. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and but, but what was interesting about this study, um, Claudia, was the fact that there are many more women at the base of the politics. You understand, many more women at the base, but the men are portrayed to the front, the men are at the front. But when you look at the strength of the man, if you look at who is behind him, you see the women rallying. And what was good about the book too was that it recognized some of those stalwarts in terms of the women who stood you know, through thick and thin, who were the mama misers, you understand, of the politics in this country. Um, so it's good reading for young people, and I think it can only serve to inspire. I was inspired by just being in the setting with some of those women, you know, like Gertrude George and um, the former prime minister's wife, um, Janice Compton. You know, you listen to the story, Mrs. Murray. You know, there are lots of persons in there who really made a difference, not in terms of the big picture, but in just the little things they did, you know, to support the processes. So I think it's good reading for young people. And I think it can only serve to inspire them to be able to, to get to the top. And I think based on that book, I could see perhaps another 50 women getting involved in a short <laughs> space of time in the politics of this country. And not just politics, but in the leadership um, of, the, of the politics in St. Lucia. 45 minutes really goes fast. Um, we need to wrap up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Minister, yes, thank you so much for being with us. Um, we have to wrap up. Sheffield, you need to make it really quick. 30 and not What's sports. The, the purpose behind the rebranding of the Festival of Lights to the December Festival. Okay. Quick. Yeah. Well, w December Festival. It's, it's Christmas time in St. Lucia. It's um, December when we celebrate, we celebrate lights. I, 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 you know, it, it's rebranding. And rebranding is all about sometimes just appealing, you understand, to the new generation. A lot of us grew up with it as Festival of Lights. But I think now what you want is a, is a, is a wider cross-section of people becoming involved. Um, and Festival of Lights in the past was primarily focused in the city. Mm -hmm. We want now the entire country to embrace it. You know? So the December festivals for St. Lucia includes lights, includes lanterns, includes music. And that happens across our country. We want to embrace everybody. And that was, I think, the prime purpose of making sure we transform it. Inclusiveness is the focus. And remember, we are a government of inclusiveness and bringing in all solutions because we believe that is the only way we can thrive as a country. People need to come together, people need to feel apart, people need to be engaged in the process. We cannot do it one on, you know, by ourselves. 
Both parties, political parties, must be all parties must be a part of that process. People living in communities first. The politicians will come and go, but our people will always be there on the ground in the communities, living together, working together. And we must recognize that. And as a government of the people, for the people, by the people, that is our philosophy. Okay, a great note of unity to end on. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for being with us here today and being so frank and open in your discussions. Thank you to the members of the media and thank you to those listening to us live on NTN and on YouTube. Um, until next year, when we will have another briefing room. Um, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>